All right, so like I mentioned, uh, since we have the exam coming up on Tuesday during lecture time, and we do have a lab scheduled afterwards, uh, we're going to continue lecturing here for just a little bit to keep us on pace, and uh, then we will lay it up there for the weekend, I think. Um, so we've been talking about uh, buffers here, and again, uh, we talked about really how buffers function and really why uh, a buffer does need to be a weak acid uh, and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid. Again, being that weak acid or base or really that weak electrolyte allows to keep both the acid part and the base part in the solution, which as we saw with those sort of reactions is essential for how it's able to function. Uh, without the presence of an acid and a base in those solutions uh, that are buffers, uh, it wouldn't be able to handle any additional H plus that would come in from the acid, and it wouldn't be able to handle any additional OH minus that would come in from the base. Uh, here's an example of another sort of buffer system, a common one. This is acetic acid and sodium acetate. Uh, once again, that would be our acid part of the buffer and the sodium acetate. And really just the acetate ion there is the functioning part of the base part of that buffer. And again, because acetic acid will set up that weak acid uh, equilibrium, and you will add a little bit more sodium acetate to the solution as well. Usually when you would make it, that will allow you to have pretty good concentrations of both of those to begin with, which should handle any additional acid that comes in. Again, it will get tied up by reacting with the acetate ion and really forming acetic acid. While well, if you decide to add some base to it, it would get uh, tied up with the H plus from the acetic acid and basically get tied into the water aspect of it. So it is really only the free H plus or OH minus ions that are floating around in the solution that really will have a big effect on the pH. So since they do get sort of incorporated into other things here, as we talked about, it keeps those levels of H plus and OH minus relatively constant, and thus would also keep the pH relatively constant as well. Um, <clears throat> buffers, as I mentioned, are really common ion problems. So this is 100% the place where you should use your henderson hasselbalch equation. And it really does need to be a buffer situation in order to use that equation. Um, and if it's not a buffer situation, again, don't use it. There's a lot of places in these next couple of chapters where you've got enough numbers to kind of put it into that equation, and people are very oftentimes tempted to do so. So don't do it unless those two things are related to each other in a buffer sort of format, a weak acid and conjugate base or a weak base and conjugate acid. If not, definitely do not use the energy off block equation. Any questions on how a buffer works, how it functions? <clears throat> now, Although we did talk about the idea that you cannot have a buffer that is strictly made up of a weak acid, I'm sorry, of a strong acid or strong base, uh, you can actually make a buffer from a reaction of a strong acid or a strong base with the appropriate sort of weak partner. So for example, if you took some sodium hydroxide and you reacted it with some acetic acid, it's going to do a double displacement reaction here. And these two guys are gonna switch partners and that will form you some sodium acetate and some water. Now, this sodium hydroxide here is not the buffer. The buffer doesn't happen until this reaction is complete and the only things that you have left are those two things at the end. So it is possible to sort of do a reaction with a strong base and a weak acid or a weak base and a strong acid, but that reaction is actually not the buffer. The buffer is a result, the end product of that reaction. So in this case, what you would be left with in this reaction is all the sodium hydroxide would be gone, and these would be really the only two things that would be left in the solution. And then you have just really kind of made a buffer from that reaction. So sometimes people will talk about sort of making a buffer in the solution, uh, in citra, sometimes called, and that's a reaction of strong acid and a weak, uh, strong acid and a weak base or a strong base and a weak acid. But again, the strong acid and strong base is completely used up. 
by the time the buffer is made. So it's no longer there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see here. So again, this is just a graphical representation of what we've been talking about. Obviously the buffer here able to maintain pretty much its pH while we do see in a non-buffer with the water because of the increase in the H plus concentration, a fairly big jump in the pH, actually drop in the pH, I guess is the way to say that, uh, as we add more acid to it, again, because of that buildup of the H plus that is just freely floating in that solution. All right, so let's take a moment or two here and decide which of these could be a buffer system. All right, let's take a look. So remember that in order for it to be a buffer, uh, we need basically either a weak acid and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid. And really the definition is the same bronze Lowry definition that we talked about. There pretty much should just be a one H plus difference between those two things in order for them to be related to each other. So we'll start here with A. A, we have uh, HF and KF. Is this a buffer system? This would be a buffer system. It's the one we just used. Basically, this is hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid. And KF here is really the salt of its conjugate base. KF is really K plus and F minus, with F minus once again being really the base, uh, the buffer component there is the F minus there. So that definitely would be a base. Coming to B, B is HBr and KBr. So uh, that is an acid and that is K plus and Br minus. So these two things are related to each other. HBr is what type of acid? It is hydrobromic acid, it is a strong or weak? It is a strong acid, which means can it be a buffer? It cannot be a buffer here because once again, this is going to be a strong acid, which means it's going to 100% break apart into this. And really the only thing that you'll have in that solution is this guy. So it won't be able to set up that equilibrium and keep both parts in the solution. So not a buffer. Remember we had that list of like six or so really strong acids is a good one to keep in mind, especially through these chapters. Again, HCl is a strong acid. HI is a strong acid, HBr is a strong acid, nitric acid, perchloric acid, a little sulfuric acid. So that's a list of some strong acids. And pretty much if it's not one of those, it's probably a pretty safe bet that it's going to be a weak acid. So that's a good little list to keep in mind um, as you go through some of these. Here we will have a little sodium carbonate and a little sodium bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate for C. Uh, so really here we have this guy here and we have this guy here. And if we get rid of the sodium, which is really spectator ions, we have bicarbonate and we have carbonate, which are a difference of each other of 1H plus and hydrogen carbonate and carbonate come from carbonic acid, which I do not see on my list, which is H2CO3, which means I can make a pretty safe assumption that that's going to be a weak acid. And this would be as conjugate base. So this would be a buffer. By the way, the acid one here, those two choices, which would be which one is be the acid? Would this be the acid or the guy on the right? It would be the one on the left. The acid again needs to donate an H plus. So it's got the extra H plus. This guy has one less H plus. So again, usually the one with one more H plus would be the acid in that situation. One with one less H plus would be the base. So again, that's a good way to recognize it. Any questions on how to identify them there? <clears throat> Okay, then let's talk then about really buffer calculations and uh, how we want to approach some of these calculations. 
So first off, we'll start with A. Uh, so why don't you work through A, calculate the pH of this buffer that is one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate, the Ka value here for acetic acid, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So work on A here for a few minutes and then we'll talk about it. And then we'll talk about B here, I think together and how to approach it. Talk about what's going on in that situation. Okay, so let's take a look. So uh, first off, they were nice enough to tell us it is a buffer. Uh, they are not always nice enough in all problems to tell you it is a buffer. So we do want to make sure we look at what we got going on here, and hopefully you should be able to recognize that there is a relationship between these two things. Um, again, that's acetic acid and sodium acetate. So by recognizing that relationship that really these things are only a difference of one H plus difference, uh, and that's a weak acid. And by the way, I know it's a weak acid because I see the Ka value there on the bottom. So all these are things that you don't want to overlook as you're going through the problem. Uh, that should automatically tell you it's a buffer type situation if they, again, didn't straight out tell you it was a buffer situation. Because it's a buffer situation, as we talked about, you really do have two ways to solve this problem. You can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, uh, which might be the easiest move. Uh, or you can do an ice table. And remember, if you do the ice table, you need a number on both sides of the arrow there, right, for your common ion. So you can do it either way. Again, they both should come out the same. Uh, in this case, I'm going to actually roll with the Henderson Hasselbalch equation because I recognize that it is a buffer. So we have one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate swimming around in the solution there. Again, the Ka value here, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So this means that uh, we're going to do the pKa value that we did a little bit earlier, minus the log of the Ka, minus the log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus five, it's going to give us 4.74. Uh, that means pH will equal pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. So it's gonna be uh, 4.74 plus the log. You can't really screw up in this case since they're both the same molarity, but once again, this would be our acid has one more H than this guy. And this guy's got the spectator ion, which is usually where the base is at because frankly, it has one less H plus in this case. That means we'll take a uh, log of one over one. That is gonna zero us out over here. And that would give us an opening pH for this buffer of 4.74 in this case. Once again, if you chose to do the ice table approach, you would want to do it with the weak acid as your reaction. And initially you would have one here zero here and the most important thing here would be to make sure as we talked about you got that one on that side we'll have minus x plus x plus x and at equilibrium one minus x x and one plus x this obviously would go into our ka you would solve for x x would equal the h plus concentration then you could go to the pH. And again, that should get you the same answer as you got above. So obviously you don't need to do it both ways. You could choose whichever way you're more comfortable doing. Some people just like to stick with the ice table. Some people will roll with the henderson Hasselbalch. Again, henderson Hasselbalch probably a little bit less room for error, hopefully. Any questions on the first part here? So this is just our buffer. And now what we're going to do here in our second part of the problem is uh, we're going to actually add some strong acid to our buffer. So in this case, we want to know what is the pH uh, when we add 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. In this particular problem, and only in this particular problem, uh, we're just going to assume that the total volume of everybody is one liter, just to kind of keep the numbers not so all over the place. Um, in a lot of cases, you do need to take into account the volume of everybody. But in this case, just to do this first example, we're going to assume everybody's volume is one liter. 
So we need to think about a couple of things that's really important when we talk about buffers and later when we talk about titrations. And that is when I have a solution like a buffer solution and I take something like hydrochloric acid, which is also a solution, and I dump it in there, does the molarity of everybody stay the same? Does the molarity stay the same when you dump the HCl into that solution? The answer actually is uh, it does not. And that is because when we add the HCl in, right, we are changing the volume. And molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. So every time you add a, another solution to another solution, the volume of that solution actually continues to change. And that means the molarity actually continues to change. The one thing that doesn't change is actually the moles of the solute. So the moles actually stay the same. Which question is? No, I meant in general, not specific to this, not specific to this question, but in general, when you add, you know, something to a buffer or, you know, any type of solution to a solution, in general, what happens is obviously the molarity changes because the volume changes outside of this example, obviously. Um, and that is why it's really an important sort of concept that when you add any type of solution to another, like you add acid to a buffer, you add base to a buffer, and later when we talk about titration, which when you do a titration right, you're doing nothing but constantly adding volume, right, as you're titrating and adding it from the burette. We want to make sure that we actually do our ice tables in moles, because moles really do not change throughout there, right? So, Whenever you have some situation like we have here in B, when we're going to be adding a volume uh, of a liquid to another liquid or a solution to another solution, we do want to do the first ice table in moles, and then you want to convert back afterwards into molarity. So that's a good approach. Moles on the first one, convert back to molarity on the second one, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. By the way, when we talk about a solution and the molarity, what is really reacting when we have like a solution there floating around? Is it the solvent or the solute? It is really the solute part of the molarity there. That's really what's in the solution, you know, kind of floating around and reacting and stuff like that. So um, that's why we look at mole. So, Important aspect of these calculations in this chapter for sure and beyond adding volume should do an ice table in moles and then immediately after that you should convert back to molarity. I was saying nine times out of 10 you're going to need molarity to continue on with the next calculation that may be there. So it's really good practice to do that and not leave it in moles. Uh, there is a place where it'll work out okay, but uh, you should really just kind of convert it back to molarity. Okay, so with that being said, what we're going to do here is we're going to take our buffer and we're going to add our HCl. And once again, just in this specific example, we're going to keep everybody's concentration, uh, everybody's volume at one liter. Uh, so we basically have our one molar acetic acid. We got our one molar sodium acetate. And it was 0.1 molar, I believe, right? Uh, HCl that we're going to add. And again, in terms of the volume of everybody, we're just going to use one liter for everybody's volume here to make all the numbers simple. So what's going to happen here is we want to get the reaction that's going to take place. So when I add my HCl to my buffer here, which is obviously made up of these two things, the HCl is going to react with what thing here? HCl is a strong acid, so it should react with which part of the buffer here? The base part, which is the sodium acetate. So what's going to happen when we add the HCl to our buffer is the HCl will then react with the sodium acetate. And this is really just a double displacement reaction, positive, negative, positive, negative. So everybody here is going to switch partners, basically. The end result of that is uh, here we will 
make uh, some sodium chloride and a little sodium acetate. No, we will not. We will make some acetic acid. It would be better. Come back. Uh, sorry about that. We'll make some acetic acid. Now, as we talked about earlier, anytime you react a buffer with either an acid or base, one part of the buffer gets used up, right? And you make the other part of the buffer. So in most buffer problems, you have almost the entire reaction there for you to see because it's up here in the problem. So if you're ever struggling for like what it makes, it's the other part of the buffer is what it makes and you'll be okay. Now, because again, this is going to be a situation where we're adding volume, we do want to do this ice table in moles. So obviously to convert these to moles, we would multiply one times one, which would give us one mole of each of these guys here in this particular case. If we were not keeping the volume constant, we would need to multiply by the actual volume, right? Convert it to liters to make sure we get the right mole. So in a real problem, you would need to convert the volume to liters, multiply it by the molarity, and that would get you the moles. But in this case, we basically have one mole of everything except for the HCl, which would be 0.1 mole. All right, so initially here, we're going to do our HCl, which would be 0.1 mole. We're going to have our sodium acetate, which is one mole. And we're also going to make sure we do not leave this guy as a zero because it is a buffer. So we should have a mole of the acetic acid here as well. Once again, if you leave off the guy on the right, you did not do the correct problem. And that is again, a very common error that people make. They will zero out that guy on the right. So it's not a buffer unless you got the both guys there present to begin with. Any questions on that so far? So in moles here. Now, typically when we do an ice table in moles, we usually will not use X's because we kind of will know what's going to happen here. So what's going to happen here is when I toss the HCl into this buffer and my buffer is hopefully functioning correctly, what should happen to the HCl? Should it stay? Should it get used up? It should get used up. So in this case, what's going to happen, the HCl is actually going to be like the limiting reagent. It's going to get used up. It's not going to be a problem because frankly, we got one mole of sodium acetate there to take care of the 0.1 mole of the acid. So we got plenty of the base part, right, to take care of it. So because we actually know the change, we don't really need to use X's here. We could actually just use the number. So that's what we're going to do. The change part here will be minus 0.1, which is again, like your limiting reagent. This would be minus 0.1. And what I always mess up on, this is a plus 0.1, not minus on that side. That is going to get us to our equilibrium here of zero for our HCl. And it's late, so I'm gonna use the calculator, no shame. 0.9 moles of this guy. And this will go without the calculator assistance, 1.1 moles on that side. Any questions on the ice table? So a couple of different things here that we do with the ice table when we are adding volume to volume. First off, most important thing, everybody needs to be in moles. Second thing is we usually will know what the change will be. It is the limiting reagent. By the way, you can easily find the limiting reagent because it should always be the smaller or larger number. It should always be the smaller number because if I subtract a larger number, what do I end up with? a negative number, which you can't have, right? So you gotta always go with the small, right? When in doubt, go with the small one, you'll probably be okay. After we do this first ice table here, this is always a very good place to convert it back to molarity. And we would do that by dividing by the total volume here. In this case, since we're keeping everybody at one liter, we're going to divide by one liter. If we were not keeping the volume constant, you would need to figure out the total volume at this point of your buffer that you started with and the amount of acid you added, right? And you add them together, convert them to liters, and that's what you should divide by at this point. So in a problem where we're not keeping a constant, that would obviously be the total volume of your buffer plus whatever you added, right? Converted to liters. 
and we would divide this guy by one liter as well. That's gonna give me 0 0.9 molar for that guy. And we'll go this way, 1.1 molar for this guy. First off, any questions so far? All right, at this point, a lot of people get to the point and go, <laughs> I'm not really sure what I should do next, right? So you should always look at your ice table and that's why it's important to write these reactions and actually have a real ice table there because your ice table could really help you decide what you should do next. If you look at our ice table at this point, we could see that we have pretty much acetic acid left over and we have sodium acetate left over. Those two things, are they related to each other? They are related to each other. This is still a buffer, yeah? Which means because this is a buffer, to figure out the pH, I could simply now go into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So at this point, I could go into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which the pH would be the pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. Our pKa value is still the same one that we used previously. So that is our 4.74 based off of acetic acid's Ka value plus the log. And in this case, the base is this guy, right? The sodium acetate, which is 0 0.9. That is acetic acid over here at equilibrium, which would be our acid of 1.1. And we're going to do a 0 0.9 uh, divided by 1.1. We're going to take the log of it. We're then gonna add it to 474. And we're gonna end up with a pH of 4.65 after I add in my acid. <clears throat> Again, alternative to this is if you do not want to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, I'm not sure why you would not want to use it, but if you don't want to use it, uh, you would have to do a second ice table at this point. And again, a second ice table at this point would be the acetic acid dissociating into the H plus and the acetate. And our initial concentrations would be our equilibrium concentrations from above. So those guys would come down and we would do 1.1 here. We would be zero. We would do uh, 0 0.9 here. And the rest would be like normal minus X plus X plus X. Equilibrium 1.1 minus X, X and 0 0.9 plus X. Obviously solve for X and that gets you your H plus concentration and to your pH. So you, you do have an option if you want to do the ice table, you can. Uh, again, equilibrium concentrations become your initials if you choose to do that. As you saw there, we did have to switch some guys around, so make sure everybody gets to the right spot. First off, any questions on that calculation? <clears throat> Why did I not write anything in this column where the sodium chloride is? What is sodium chloride? It is a neutral salt, which means it's not gonna screw up the pH and you should not screw up yourself by putting numbers there that you might use incorrectly, right? So if you know something like that's not gonna be involved, you know something like water is not gonna be involved, don't put X's there, don't put numbers there so you don't aren't tempted to do something you shouldn't do in that case. Question. <clears throat> so did our buffer work okay? Let's see, we started with a pH of our buffer of 4.74. We then added some HCl to it and it went to 4.65, which is not a very big jump. It basically maintained its pH, but it did move in the correct direction. Since we added an acid, we expect the pH to go down and it did, but not a big jump in pH. Question on any of that there. So while we have this example up here, let's talk about what would happen if, you know, we did mess up, right? So let's say we had our same sort of buffer system and we're gonna still add our HCl. And we're gonna add that, obviously gonna react with our sodium acetate like it did on the other side there. And that will get us some of our sodium chloride and our acetic acid, right? All right. 
so we're going to uh, go, all right, I accidentally grabbed the 18 molar HCL instead of my 0.1 molar. Could happen, there's a lot of numbers. And if we kept this guy also at one liter, that's a lot of acid. That's gonna give us 18 moles of HCL, right? So initially here we would have, in this case, by grabbing the wrong bottle, 18 moles of it. Uh, we would still have one mole of this guy. We would have one mole of this guy. Now, when we get to the change part, what's going to happen in this case? Which one is like the limiting reagent in this case? It is now this guy, that is the smaller number, right? We have nowhere near enough moles to take care of all of that. So the change that's going to happen in this case is actually minus one, minus one, and plus one, which means when you reach equilibrium, you will have 17 moles of the HCL, that will all be gone, and you will now have like two moles of your acetic acid. You can convert these back to molarity at that point, but if we look at our ice table, we are basically left with acetic acid and hydrochloric acid at this point. By the way, is that a buffer? It is not, even though we have two numbers, it is not a buffer. Those are two acids. We have a really strong acid that you just now dumped 17 moles of H plus into that solution. And you actually have a weak acid, which is gonna contribute some H plus. Between the two, we should expect the pH to pretty much jump off the scale, right? It should have a really big jump. We no longer have a buffer at this point. So this is what we were talking about earlier where you could kind of blow through your buffer. If you add, again, maybe the wrong amount of acid or base, too strong for the buffer that you made. And that's why when you do make a buffer, again, you wanna think about what is the molarity and really how many moles of the acid and base part of the buffer is this applying? And will that be enough for any additional acid or base that you add? As you can see here, by just grabbing the wrong thing or adding too much, you could blow through your buffer and that's what we would see here. So obviously we would not have a buffer at this point. And we would see a big decrease probably in the pH, right? It would drop way, way low as there's a ton of now of H plus in there. Any questions on that there? All right, then let's do a, a problem where we're not gonna keep the volume uh, constant. We want to calculate the pH of a 0.3 molar NH3 and a uh, 0.36 molar NH4Cl buffer system before and after you add 20 milliliters of 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide to 80 mils of the buffer. So we are looking for two answers here. Uh, we are looking for what is the pH of the buffer by itself and what is the uh, pH uh, after we add the uh, in this case, sodium hydroxide to the buffer. Let me give you a Ka value, which would probably be helpful, I imagine, at this point. So let me think about what that Ka value will be. Um, all right, Ka value for... NH4 plus will be 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. All right, so uh, give a few, give a go after it here. We're looking for two answers, just what is the pH of the initial buffer solution. And then here we're adding some sodium hydroxide to it. In this case, we are not keeping volumes constant. So in the case where we're adding uh, the sodium hydroxide, you do need to take everybody's volumes into account. Let's see what you come up with here. All right, well, let's take a look and see how we're doing. Uh, so we're looking for really two uh, answers here. We're looking for what the initial buffer pH is. And then afterwards, we are then going to be adding some sodium hydroxide to it and we're looking to see what will happen uh, to it afterward. 
Again, they do tell us it's a buffer, but once again, if they didn't, you need to be able to recognize that that is NH3 and that really is NH4 plus. And again, that is your buffer components here. Those two things are really related to each other. This is really the buffer system that we're looking at. Again, the difference between these two is just an H plus. So because we know it's a buffer and because we could recognize it, hopefully, Again, we do have two options as to how you could solve it. If you want to take the ice table approach, you would do it. You actually have two ways you could do it. You could do it uh, with the NH4 plus. So you could do the NH4 plus plus some water and it's going to donate that over there. And in this case, uh, we would have uh, NH3 and H3O plus. Obviously, you would use the initial molarity on both of those sides for that. You could also have done a uh, NH3 uh, plus some water and that will accept it this way. And that will give you NH4 plus and OH minus. You would use the initial concentration here and here. The difference between these two is this would be a KA situation. The bottom one would be a KB situation and you would get the POH at the end of that route and rather than the pH if you went this route. So there are a few different ways you could do it. Probably the better way maybe is, since it is a buffer, we can go right into our pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. Uh, we do have a Ka value given to us, so we could get our pKa from that minus the log 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. Uh, in this case, then uh, looks like a 925 on the pKa value. So uh, that would give us 9.25 plus the log. Once again, here, the base is going to be the NH3. It actually has one less H plus, if you're not sure. And we also see the Ka value for this guy, which would make it the acid in that particular case. Uh, so we will go with 0.3 up on top and 0.36. I could use molarity here because I'm not adding anything to the buffer. We're just getting the pH of the buffer, so we could use the molarity at this point. And if you do that there, I want to say 9.17. I'll check on my calculator, but I hope so. Divided by 0.36, log of the answer plus a 925 or 9.17 would be our opening pH here. This is an acidic basic neutral pH. It is a basic, which means this is really a basic buffer and it worked perfectly fine with our henderson hasselbach equation. Alternatively, you could have had the K PKB and use that POH version, but again, you got to subtract 14 to get to the pH anyways. So why not just get the pH up front and be done with it? Any questions on the opening part here? All right, so next we're going to actually do a little bit of adding here. And we're going to be adding some sodium hydroxide to this buffer. So when I add the sodium hydroxide to this buffer, it will react with which part of the buffer here? Yeah, it is going to react with the ammonium, this guy right here. The ammonium chloride is what it should react with, as that's the acid part. If you're not sure, again, that is where the Ka value is, right, which tells us that is the acid. You could either do the NH4+, plus or you could do the ammonium chloride. It is your call. And we'll do that, and we will get a double displacement reaction where the sodium will end up over here. Uh, the H will end up over here, and we're going to get a bunch of stuff actually at the end of this one. Uh, we'll get a little sodium chloride. We'll get a little ammonia when it gets away the H plus, and we will also get some water that will happen in this situation. So uh, the H plus is coming over from here to the OH, and that's where the water comes from. The sodium hooks up with the chloride, and when the NH4 loses the H plus, it ends up as NH3. Got a lot of stuff on the right-hand side, but frankly, none of it's going to be used except for the NH3, right? Water not involved in the equilibrium. Sodium chloride is a neutral salt, so we're not going to worry really about any of those two. We really just need to worry about the NH4, NH3 on that side. 
Any questions on that equation there? I should do this ice table in molarity or moles? I should do it in moles here because we are adding sodium hydroxide to it. So we do want to calculate the moles of everybody. It's going to kind of get rid of some of this here and do it up on top, I think. All right, so we pretty much want to calculate the moles of pretty much everybody that is there. So uh, we got a bunch of stuff to do here. We will start with our buffer. And by the way, the 80 mils means in that 80 mils, you have both of those things in there, right? So that 80 mils goes for both parts of the buffer. We do need to convert it to liters. So you need to divide by a thousand or move the decimal place. So the moles of NH3 should be 0 0.08 liters times the molarity of the NH3, which is 0.3 moles per liter for NH3. And that will get us uh, 0 0.08 times 0 0.3. It's gonna give us 0 0.024 moles of NH3. We'll do a similar calculation for the NH4 plus, so the moles of the NH4Cl. Also, 80 milliliters is in the same beaker, so it has the same volume. We'll use the 0.36 moles per liter, the NH4Cl, and that will give us 0 0.08 times 0 0.36. It's going to get us 0 0.0288 moles of NH4Cl. And lastly here, uh, we're going to look for the moles of our sodium hydroxide we're gonna add. So get rid of that there. And that would be, in this case, uh, the molarity is here, and that is the volume of the sodium hydroxide we're adding. So the moles of sodium hydroxide will be 0 0.02 liters times the molarity of the sodium hydroxide 0 0.05 moles per liter. It's going to give us a 0 0.02 times 0 0.05. Looks like 0 0.001 uh, moles of sodium hydroxide. Any question on any of those calculations there? <clears throat> so now that we got the moles of everybody, and obviously you can see we do need to take obviously the volume into account and make sure we convert it to liters and get the moles. We're going to put all these numbers into our ice table here. So initially for our sodium hydroxide, we got 0 0.001 moles. For our ammonium chloride, we have uh, 0 0.0288 moles. Sodium chloride, I'm not gonna worry about. I'll put an X there. Uh, the water, I'm not gonna worry about either. Uh, that leaves me just the ammonia here I need to worry about, which is 0 0.024 moles. Any questions on that there? The change that's going to happen in this case should be, the again, the smaller number. So we would expect the sodium hydroxide to get all used up by the buffer if it's working properly. It is a smaller number. So once again, our change is going to be minus 0 0.001 moles minus 0 0.001 moles and a plus 0 0.001 moles. That means at equilibrium, we will end up with no moles of the sodium hydroxide. We will end up with uh, 0 0.0288 minus 0 0.001, 0 0.0278 moles of our ammonium chloride and 0 0.024. Remember, we are adding on that side. So that is 0 0.001 added to that there. Gets us 0 0.025 moles of this guy. Any questions so far? At this point, we want to uh, divide by the total volume. So remember that we started with 80 milliliters of our buffer. We then added 20 milliliters of our base to it, which means our total volume now that we've added it is going to be 
100 milliliters, right? So 80 from the original buffer and 20 milliliters from the sodium hydroxide that we dumped in there. That is important because that is the volume we're going to use to convert everybody back to molarity. That means we do need to convert that into liters as well. So we will divide by the total volume here, which in this case is 0.1 liters. Yeah. That obviously is 100 milliliters that has been converted into the liters. So we go uh, 0 0.0278 divided by 0 0.1, it's going to give us 0 0.278 molar. 0 0.025 divided by 0 0.1 is going to give us 0 0.25 molar. Any question on the ice table where any numbers came from or anything like that? <clears throat> so at this point, we're looking for the pH. So again, I can't emphasize enough not to overlook your ice table and actually your reaction that you have there. We could clearly see at this point, the only two things that we have left in the ice table really that's going to affect the pH are these two guys. And are they related to each other? They are related to each other. That is still the same buffer we started with, basically. So we now still have a buffer at this point. And again, because we know that this is still a buffer, we once again can return to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation with our new numbers. And we will do that. I think I left just enough room there on the bottom. So the pH here is going to be it is still the same pKa value that we used previously. So it's still the 9.25 plus the log of our base, which once again, the base is the NH3. It has one less hydrogen and the acid here has one more hydrogen. So we do want to put the 0 0.25 up on top, the 0 0.278 on the bottom. And if we do that, uh, 0.25 divided by 0.278, take a little log action of it, add it to uh, 925, going to get us a whopping pH of 2 point, no, 9.20. First off, uh, did the buffer work in this case? Did it maintain its pH basically? It did, right? It started at 9.17. We added some base to it. It went up a grand total of 0 0.03 units, right, to 9.2. But it did go in the correct direction, right? We added a base, which means we should expect it to kind of inch up in terms of the pH. And uh, it did in this case. So again, if you were to do this calculation and you ended up with a pH less than what you started with, it definitely went in the wrong direction. You probably flopped some guys around in terms of numbers. So these are things you want to think about, you know, does these things sort of make sense as you're doing it? And if it doesn't, then, you know, very commonly think get kind of base for acid, acid for base. By the way, when you do make a buffer, you can never usually ever make it perfectly to what you're aiming for in terms of the pH. So that's why it being able to resist changes in pH is really good, but it still moves as you can see when you add acid or base. So typically when you make a buffer and you're shooting for like a 9.17, you might not get 9.17 when you weigh out everything and put everything together. So the way that you typically adjust the buffer is actually take a strong acid or strong base and go like drop, drop, drop. And you could dial in pretty much the exact pH that you need by either adding some more acid a little bit or a little bit, some drops of base. If you happen to be a little bit higher in what you wanted or a little bit lower. So you could actually just dial it in using the strong acid or base to the appropriate pH that you're really looking to make. And at that point, then you can do whatever you want with it. Any question on buffers, calculation with buffers? We should let that all soak in for the weekend, yes. All right, we're going to lay it up there, I think, in terms of lecturing for now.